So all of them did come back. They said they wanted the Katalaya period. And that's how we went back. And we had a storytelling period allotted in the curriculum, in the timetable. And we started going once a week. Mrs. Premalata was the head of the school in Madurai. And she and to adults sometimes to the teachers on what they are actually trying to do. And then we used to invite them so the children could follow, you know, what that person was actually singing or narrating through his, you know, arts. So, uh, I don't want to go on. Uh, this happened during 1990. We have already had a research week. We were called for consultancy to some schools. We were doing teacher training programs. We were setting up sometimes the libraries in the schools. We were also doing our stories on wheels. And we were also going for the once a week storytelling programs. We were all place to another. So we decided to house everything. And we have opened a small, very small resource center. I would even call it a godown for us, where we dumped all these articles like the puppets, the, the cloths, the research work that we have done, the documentation that we have done, everything, uh, kits and methods and techniques and whatever for your future too. Um, I'm going to just also uh, rush you through a few slides because uh, so far it was all only written work. Just a few glances because we have more than 2,000 to 3,000 photographs taken and we've just rummaged through it and put them together so that you will get a fair idea of what we've done. That was a Sh Sheila Kutavala school that, um, that you see. And these are the different types of storytellers that we also met and we've recorded a few of them. Okay, we started this called Toy Theatre, which was also very uh, fascinating. Uh, we will be doing a, a workshop on this, which will be part of the advanced uh, workshop, because it needs at least a whole day to make this uh, theatre, to write a script for it, and to know how to manipulate it. So we're going to have this in the advanced workshop. Uh, this is very fascinating for people, especially for the primary school children, sometimes for the uh, decades or... Uh, this is the Kamishibai uh, Japanese storytelling. Uh, this is a book, actually. They have made it into a huge, large book from the small book, and they've stuck. It. This is something called the Apron Theatre. You see the person, one of the resource person, again in Japan, and she has this lovely apron on which she had her puppets, and she would just, you know, pull out like magic things and manipulate them. And she had this whole it's three Billy Gold story and she had this whole bridge on which to uh, the zoo and the other places. We also talked to them a lot. We tell children a lot of animal stories. Uh, I think it gives them a totally different attitude of animals still when we say that and we, uh, when we actually take them also. You know, it reinforces it. That is a little bit of, I would say, biology, botany, you know, about the plant life that you are so and this is the last teacher training workshop that we have here at Ashiva. And down you will see it is only for the special, uh, the teachers who handle special children. Because the workshop meant only for them. And this is all in the open air that we've had storytelling sessions, one of the <coughs> workshops. Now this is with all the librarians who are part of this uh, manga library which is very famous manga comics in Japan, so it was very uh, nice to see all of them working very hard with that library there. Um, I must tell you something about the children in Japan also. They are very hospitable. They have this tradition and culture which they have, you know, very well adapted to their technology also. They have technology and everything on one side. They have also retained their art, manners, hospitality and culture. So you see the children, as soon as they saw us, they came, they crowded around us, asked us who we are, and they immediately rummaged into their bags and they got out such beautiful origami uh, craft work which they had done and they gave it like, they were the mayors and the village heads over there, I mean the town uh, heads. And they are doing a lot of work to break down this in South Africa. Uh, this is about the story of the 
Vidyalaya. We'll just show you a few more slides about storytellers and storytelling forms that we have just you know recorded so it will be easier for you to know what we are all talking about, what we are going to be talking to you about in the next two days.
Maybe you have a beautiful singing voice. Maybe you tell jokes very well. Maybe you have such a rich family life that has been passed on in stories. Maybe you remember growing up so well in, in a compound in Kerala or uh, an old house in the outskirts of, of Chennai or Bangalore. Um, begin where you are. Take your own interests and talents. Look at the children that you're working with, your own children and your parents here today, your students, if you're in this the children you work with, if you're from a, an NGO, and a story, a story you hear this workshop now, uh, a story that you read, a story that's in the syllabus that you have to tell. Um, you take these stories and, and make a notebook, a storyteller's journal, a storyteller's notebook that reminds you of the stories you have to tell. And you go back, because if you're truly dedicated to storytelling, you may start with five stories, but that will grow to 10 and then 20, and it will keep growing. And you'll probably, over the years, you'll start telling some stories now, and then you'll keep finding new ones. And five years later, you, if you have this record, you can go back and say, oh, that's a good story. I forgot that story. So keep your repertoire growing and remind yourself of it. And look a little bit at the materials of the storyteller, the story material. We don't want to spend a lot of time because we don't have a lot of time. But I want to point out an area or two that would give you, I think, some good help. And then i just show you a few brief uh, looks at props. You will be seeing other uh, props 20 years. Uh, and so my repertoire has to be pretty large. I focus on Asian stories. And you might have noticed say in a couple of these slides, it's, it always makes me a little sad, especially like the billy goats grew up in Japan. And, um, but as Americans have to look at their neighbors, we need to know more in my country about Mexico, for instance. You know, we know very little. When you don't know about your neighbors, you don't treat them well a lot of times. Just as in your own society, you need to know about different classes so that there's better treatment of, of different groups. <coughs> to be a real democracy, we would have to know each other's stories across levels. Um, so look to your own self to gather these stories. Boy with special needs. This is a, about a great trickster from Cambodia, Judge Rabbit. There are some more in that series I don't have with me. We have two in this series. One, the recent one is a, a nice collection of Asian trickster tales. And this is the slightly older one that is Asian stories, and that's another Japanese tall tale. And this is one of my favorites is um, Asian Tales and Tellers, where actually I profile a Harikatha teller and have quite a bit about Vilapattu and different traditions from India and this, as well as across Asia. And another that I didn't bring, my personal favorite, is called Jasmine and Coconut's South Indian Tales. And it's my treasure. Uh, we were paid literally Paisa per hour to make that, if you look at what we got in royalties. But it's made with my husband, and it has photos of South India, and it looks across South India at storytelling <coughs> styles, and it has over 40 stories from South India by themes and values. So um, it's, it's one I love. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of those Western-produced ones, even when I ask my publishers to give the very best price and I say that I won't take a royalty, they say, or um, uh, on their website, Tulik is a wonderful small press from Chennai. And this one I would just urge, if you're really serious about storytelling, might be a very good, easy to get on, rather reasonably priced handbook on storytelling. It's uh, 85 rupees. And it just goes, and it's telling tales from Asia. So it is trying to base from Asian materials and on Asian props and Asian techniques. And the first half uh, would be a lot of the kinds of things we'll cover today, but in much <coughs> greater depth. So it would be a really good to follow up on uh, about choosing stories, practicing them, um, finding tools to tell them, and then questions that people have come up and asked often about storytelling in schools. And then the last half uh, is a collection of stories from across Asia that uh, you could use. So I hope that then, as soon as we look at it, ah, can you turn those lights on? 
very, very noisy fan. Could we switch that off for five minutes? <laughs> you know, um, too many open. It's very hard in a lot of Indian settings. There is a lot. There is openness because you need the airflow. There may be a lot of traffic. There may be a lot of interruptions. But as much as possible, create an intimate, quiet setting. And where should the children be if it's a good informal setting? It should be a story corner of them. That would would sit snugly together. That would be perfect. That would be perfect. A story corner. I think in the beginning here, where I talked a little bit about setting the scene, um, telling, whether it's outside under a village banyan tree or in a bustling Tokyo library. And if possible, number one, make a setting for storytelling. An informal space for students gather. Many classrooms with little furniture already have such a spot. Or try doing it outside, moving the desks, as you said, whatever you can do to create that setting. Voice, voice mod, you know, your voice is an expressive tool. It can be very loud. You know, it can do so much, and India is so rich in vocal styles. There's so much you have here to inspire you. So, voice expression, gesture expression, the good setting. Over here, we have something. I'm sorry. What were you saying? We should not make the children make the children live. I believe so. You know. Now get in the line. Hurry up. Sit down. Don't move down. Sit down. And then here's our story <laughs> talk for today. <laughs> that is good. Shake it out, everybody. Get rid of that. So, um, yes, we give the mood to the students. We show them that we have a gift. What is the gift? The story. The story. We're excited. <gasps> Just went to a workshop on last week, and I have something I learned and I'm going to share it to you. It's a new story. Now, I find TV or video you can turn on. I'm a real person. I have, and I'll tell them, you know, how many stories I have. I have over 300 stories here. And I remember in picture. And if I see someone talking, <laughs> pictures might go together, you know, and I try to get them to realize. Have your story about you. Humor can do wonderful things, can't it? You know, I, I love to listen to the Happy Hatha storytellers and hear how they put it aside in some funny thing, you know, talking about Sifa's wedding and how now there were no so saris in the stores because Diwali sales were just had just happened, you know. And the way that they use humor, for instance, not only can you find a funny story, or it's very funny, and if they don't work at it, you know, it's like this, and I have to work and work, and then it may work, <laughs> or, or may not. Um, but, you know, one thing in Indian storytelling, by the way, is, well, it is, it's not unique to India, but it's found more in India, I think, than many other cultures. So I think it's a gift that you have, you should be using sometimes. It's very lovely. Well, we call that storytelling in the US. He said, no, isn't storytelling really <clears throat> where you take the story someone knows and you know the people you're telling to and you make that story new and alive and relevant to them. Isn't that really story? I said, yes. But so is what I do. You know, the end, song in the middle, song that people help you with. Especially if you want participation, it's lovely uh, to have a song everyone sings with you. So, song can be great. Again, though, if you think so, how do we, and, and I love and playing with language, so we're going to do that in a minute. There was the door, he opened the door, and inside he saw a uh, You know, <laughs> this is what we do with the pause. It's a nice way to build your suspense and stimulate your curiosity. I have, uh, I gotta tell you my other one. So you will always remember to use the pause and sometimes <coughs> slow motion. This is a bit of a dirty story, but uh, I think you'll mind. Uh, there's a trickster in Laos, and he's being very, very hurt by the priest. And the priest, you know, not all priests are perfect, as we know in any religion. This one's a mean one, and he's always young. Did you cook the rice? Yes, sir. Well, it's still hard. Cook it again. Did you sweep the floor? Yes, sir. Well, sweep it again. So mean. So finally, the boy has his day of revenge. 
The priest says, well, I'm going to the market. While I'm gone, you make sure the dog doesn't come from next door. Yes, sir. And if that dog comes, make sure he doesn't leave anything. <laughs> oh, yes, sir. If he leaves something and you don't clean it up, you eat it. <laughs> oh, sir, no. <laughs> yes. So he goes, the priest goes, and the boy thinks, makes some nice white sticky rice, gets some good brown sugar, palm sugar, mixes it together, and then with the artistry of a true artisan, he sculpts just what a dog would leave. <laughs> Piles and logs and blocks. <laughs> and finally, the priest comes back. What is this? I told you he wasn't to come and you were to clean it up. Sir, it just happened. I'll clean it up. I have some tea. No, no, I told you. You'll eat it. No, sir, don't make me eat that. Please, I'll clean it. Eat it. Now, this is when I'm convinced of the power of the pause and visualization. Because I can have 500 children. And when he goes, eat it, the boy goes, and he's just, eat it. And uh, sometimes I try to see how long I can draw this out. <laughs> can I go for two minutes? <laughs> yeah. And it's amazing. Is there anything on my finger? No, it's fine, right? But the, I have to eat it. I can't believe it. And it's so powerful and wonderful. Mm -hmm. And the kids are like, oh! <laughs> so you really have a powerful tool called storytelling. <laughs> and gesture, all of these are part of that tool. All right, so. Uh, the little handout that you have, by the way, for you, but we talked a little bit about getting set to tell, and we just <coughs> talked a bit about the tools. So I just want you to read this later at home. Um, I think we've mentioned most of them. We didn't really mention reading as part of voice work. There are several uh, exercises, so close it right now and put it away, <laughs> but it's there when you get home, okay? Philippines. The fire is wrapped with smoke. The smoke is wrapped with paper. The paper is wrapped with stone. Yeah, because no, it's from a book I'm working on. Okay. From China. They're noisy. Let's do the sign language alphabet. Yeah. C. D. I'll get that. Mm -hmm. E. <laughs> That's another I, okay. I. <laughs> you. Me. Double. <laughs> now, <laughs> let's go over the board. What is this? Okay. Yeah. What we drink starts with W. Um, can you see in the back, or would you like me to be on this? Uh, if I can see you on Not quite. <laughs> Perhaps a 
water river. And they would feel happy and proud back to their good friends. And there's his blood. And then he would be happy too. But one of the the birds flew. And so I knew this lake was big and beautiful. They loved it and wanted to see it. So they flew back to the and we saw a new Okay, so shake your hands. 
shake out. Make sure again, you know, you shake a little for, for a second there. Shake those shoulders. Yeah, something with the shoulders. Just a lot of us hold our tension here, don't we? And that, yeah. That, okay. Now our shoe.
One other way by yourself to shape is to just draw what I call a little easy script. <coughs> I'm not writing much. I never write much. Why? If we write it down, we worry about memorizing or learning. We worry about the words instead of from written, instead of worrying itself. So I never suggest you write much. But there are times when a little bit of editing is important or a word or two to help. So in this case, I, I, this is one idea. I, I made sometimes a three-fold script. And I would use just with a piece of paper like you have there. And I would ask the kids, or I would do myself, several things. First, I might write a title. Titles are good. We're not all good at writing titles. If you have a good title, though, it helps explain the story or create suspense. So it's kind of fun if you want a title. And then I usually have them um, think of the very first uh, part of the story, like if I was doing a little baby, the first image of the story. You know, these are all the little kids who can talk. And then I would write just the first line. Why? Because the first line is important. It is starting the story. It is pulling the listeners in. Now, in a family story, we have to choose when that first line is in the action. Most family stories, if you look at their shape, it's about like that. A beginning, some kind of problem, and an ending, like most stories. Of course, some are like this, they build up, and some are very, very quiet. But if you think of this, now if I'm doing this, why did I start my story at six months? I decided there. Well, let me give an example of a very popular story in America and how you would think of the form. In America, a very popular true story is a little boy or girl gets a bike, bicycle for Christmas. They go out one day to the top of the hill. They go down. They hit, get hit. They go to the hospital. And then finally, they come back home. Now, if we take this little simple story, fill up suitcases with just props. But here are a couple favorites. Um, Mama, could you hold that up? Or someone? <coughs> Two people may be right on the, I think, on the stand but up here. Because yep. parts of their life, this is a true story of all. And it is all stitched embroidery. Um, this is, okay, great, while you're up there, richest source even today for different ways of visuals to tell stories. And this is just one of the cloths from Andhra, the Kalankari, the kind of storytelling cloth that would be used in a temple storytelling, obviously telling the story of Rama in this um, longer version. The Pud, now the Pud from Rajasthan is very much more uh, here, there, kind of. Uh, the major characters are also in the center in bright colors, but the scenes of the story are scattered and are pulled together by the storyteller's wife, who illuminates each scene as her husband, the Bopa, tells the story. So there are different, so many different forms. Um, in Western group, it's not a very highly paid profession now, and so fewer and fewer people are doing it. But what's fascinating is not only the brilliant colors, and this is a smaller size, brain burnings, accidents, um, and in this case, even a story about a horrible thing that happened in Japan. Just as you saw the picture of the Hibaksha telling the stories of peace in Hiroshima, this is the Indian Pata storyteller's version of Hiroshima and the nuclear bomb. So this reacting to current events through the storytelling. That's a, another thing that's wonderful in India. And this is a really lovely visual technique that you could use. It's an easy one to adapt in the class. Um, I was in, if this one you too. No, actually, I'm sorry, one minute, I'm gonna hold it for a second, but be there ready. I was in Shanghai, and the school I worked in for the, the week in April wanted to give me something. So the first grade there, made what they called the world's first wearable book. And they took all the illustrations from one of my stories and they made different t-shirts and each kid had part of it, you know, and they'd come out and the storyteller would say, once there was a once there was a huge, it was great. Alright, now sometimes we have these wonderful big cloths and these ideas, but we say, I can't buy that, I can't 
can't find that, I can't, how do I adapt it? Well, here's an example of how we adapt a traditional form. Now, this was a very weird assignment. I was supposed to tell stories from the future when all these children were gathered at a museum to write an intergalactic constitution. Yeah, okay, right. Lots of stories out there about intergalactic and I said, with this, I said, I am a storyteller of the year 2050. And I roam the galaxy looking for stories. And when I find a story to tell, I put it on my storyteller's claw. And then I, I put this up. And you can get there too. And each one of these is from a story I made up about space. This was a space, not the sun. So we had a festival of storytelling of dark tales, and clouds came and covered the sun. This was a space spider story. This was a space uh, mystery. This was a space hero. This was a wonderful planet where people told stories in bubbles, and the storyteller especially told in golden bubbles. And so for each of these, I had characters, setting. I created this whole universe. But was I scared? Yes. Did I know it would work? No. So I put a little thing just in case. Put a ghost. And so if I saw the kids looking bored, I was going to say, yes, uh, and on Earth the other day I heard a great ghost story. And then I was going to tell them a great ghost Well, I was only supposed to do 20 minutes. 20 minutes? You didn't tell us this one. I told them. 20 more minutes? You didn't tell us this one. 20 more minutes? And then the teacher said, oh, it's time to brush your teeth. Hurry up, go. And so we had to stop. But the teachers came up and I need to take care of each other. Nice thing. So after the kids are leaving, the teachers go up and say, now where do we get the copy of the Space Storytellers Creed? Now where do we get the badges? <laughs> so that's just the thing. One, there was a woman who loved adventure. And she spent a long time looking for something new to do. One day, she saw two mountains. Ooh, she said, I'd like to fly over those mountains and see what's on the other side. So she made a glider, and she put it on her back and tried to glide over the mountains. But shh, shh, the wind pushed her back. Oh, she said, I need to fight the wind. And she saw a butterfly with wings. That's what. I could make wings, and then I could go. <coughs> so she made simple wings on an airplane and tried to go up over the mountain, but shh, shh, too much wind. And one day, so much wind that the plane <coughs> crashed, and she would have died, but luckily had a parachute. <laughs> and she floated down. Oh, she said, I am so glad to be on the ground, but I still want to get over the mountains. How can I do that? The wind is so strong. She pondered this problem and then saw a solution. In the sky, she saw a kite. She said, I'll make a spy kite. So she made a kite and put a machine to measure the wind, and she sent it over the mountain and hooked it up to her laptop computer. And without a doubt, when the wind would be quiet. So she made her final flying machine, like a gas blimp with tail feathers of a bird. She got in, and she went slowly, slowly, at just the right time, higher and higher and over the mountains. <laughs> she was so pleased. She ran up to everybody there. Hello, hello. I'm glad to meet you. I came from the other side of the mountain, and I came by myself, figured out how to do it. And she very proudly shook everyone's hands, while on her face was the biggest. So, or talk to her, get mail her, and write to her, and I'm sure she'll be most willing to look like most of your queries. <laughs> and I, I try to put a lot of information on my website, so yeah, try so exploring. Yeah, on to the website also. <laughs> that we've had in all our workshops. Thank you very much, Kathy.
and uh, we have a very small token that we do in the Indian way. Oh. And, uh, it's just a little short. Uh, yes. yes. okay. <laughs>
no, start sticking the nose of the right. I'm very happy now. I told you so. And he goes around, goes around, away. And this lion, the gigantic big lion, he is now feeling very bad. He just shrivels, shrinks, puts his head down, all his mane, turns around, and he walks away. This mosquito is feeling very really proud. He's the thunder. And the spider is relaxing and he's just waiting to go up, you know, like this. Or you could turn it over and then talk about the second part. And you could have a whole scroll done. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning. You can say that. Listen, we've done something. If you can follow the story, then we can follow the story. What happens when you present a certificate or a story in a picture form? You generally tend to use your voice while turning to the board. And if you're going to tell a story, you know there was this lion and this mosquito, and you all see in the mosquitoes. You see my voice is not even getting across to you. So I, it's a double task for me to uh, tell a story with this and also the cutout picture. And we are also want, uh, wanting to say something about the art of that place. You see what happens is, suppose I'm going to tell you a story of the lion and the mosquito, and it's a South Indian folk tale. You know, I could even hide it to recall. See, the, it's a very important thing. Why are we telling stories? One is for us to listen. And once you listen, you... Yeah, you recall it in your mind. And there's a lot of gap between what you recall here and what you actually bring out. Hundred things I think are hundred. So you can put in these small things to make it more attractive for the child. You say once upon a time in the forest, ah, there was a lion, you know. And you could just go to the audience with this lion mask and you could walk like a lion. You know, I feel very confident now because I'm very <laughs> So, and I know uh, there was a comment by one of the children in the Strand who talk said, Oh, it's lovely, except that you're still wearing a churidar. I can see your churidar. <laughs> you do look like a lion, but I can still see your churidar. So, you can do wonderful things with this mask. So, this is one thing which really attracts the child. You could go to the audience with a mask. I've also given a small illustration of the mask in that paper. You don't have, it's not very expensive. In fact, this I got in Sudar just the other day. And uh, this is made just out of the canvas. The other thing which you can do to make a mask is, you know, uh, you can have as a puppet and talk through the puppet. You know, you could also say like, uh, today, I'm a little birdie and I've come to far away and I'm, today I'm going to tell you a little story. Clap, 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 clap. Okay? And you can start the story with a bird puppet or you can have the lion as a puppet talking through the puppet to the children of the story. So that is one form again of telling a story. Uh, good morning. So, you know, you could just have it around uh, like, you know, the lion came marching through the forest. You know, that's all you need to do. So, you can just go, especially it's, it's very helpful with ghost stories, when you have witch and you want to, you know, go around and, you know, really frighten the children and you go, you know, so, you could really, really evoke something good. For that. <laughs> <laughs> so I can just mind the whole story, which is what we do sometimes with the dead new children. We just mind the story, or we just show them a lot of pictures and try to do action. <coughs>
snakes. <laughs>